Hey guys, it's Brynn with the Mom on the Rocks, and I'm here with my awesome friend Aaron. And I met Aaron uh, two years ago, is that right? Yeah, no, a year ago, a little over a year ago. So, um, Aaron also writes, is a contributing writer to Her View from Home, which is one of the publications I write for often, and we both love it. And um, so, anyway, I met Aaron at a, like a writer's retreat, and she and her friend Michelle were hanging out and they're these two like the tiniest little they would each fit into one of my little pockets these tiniest little um brunettes with the biggest smiles you've ever seen and I was like who are these tiny little babies um only to find out they're actually not that much younger than me <laughs> no. and um and it, ironically so we connected that weekend and I was like these are my people and then ironically I was speaking near in Austin, near where they live, like what, a few months after that. Yeah. And so Michelle was like, come stay with me. We'd met each other for like 20 minutes and <laughs> totally normal. I was like, okay, <laughs> fix some tacos, I'm in. And so I got to like drink beer and laugh and just yeah. connect with Aaron and Michelle. And I'm just so, so, so grateful. And now we have like 11 million text message threads that are just like cracking each other up and it's awesome. So, um, I was actually just talking to Aaron right before we started this about, I know in our extreme parenting community, um, you know, we talk about a lot of heavy stuff. Um, we talk about parenting, extreme children. We talk about medications and therapies and strategies and diagnosis and all of these things. But specifically the last, I would say probably six weeks, the, if I could say there's one struggle, it has revolved around school. Um, and I asked Aaron to speak with us, I don't know, two months ago now, and it just worked out that this was the time we were going to talk. And I was like, oh gosh, it's so needed. All of these mamas are dying because, you know, whether it's we've chosen to homeschool and now we feel like, what the heck are we doing? Whether we've chosen to send our kids back and it's now it's like virtual or hybrid or some kind of whatever. So I wanted to bring Erin on because not only do I know that she's an awesome mom, but she's also an incredible leader in education. And I don't have the background in elementary and I see how she loves her kids. Um, she and Michelle met because she was Michelle's, one of Michelle's son's teachers. And so she knew her on that level and then as a principal. And so I just, Michelle, wanted to talk to you um, just at first, if you would just give us a little bit about like your background in education, what you've done, what you're doing now. and kind of how you got into that. Yeah, definitely. So I was the little girl that just played teacher all the time. Um, <laughs> I have two brothers. I was the only girl, a um, little bit sassy. And so it just kind of fit, right? Mm -hmm. um, I, I just knew that I was like bred for that. And um, as a person of faith, like it just kind of merged with me serving other people. And even though I don't discuss that in my, my role, I get to love on people. Yeah. And so you know, it's, it's so much more than just a career to me um, because it's people and impact and legacy. Um, so this is my 13th year in education. Um, I taught kinder, pre-K, kinder, and first. I love the little babies, specifically teaching to read. Like when that light bulb goes on and they discover they're a reader, it's like, yes. <laughs> um, that's just, that's my jam. So I um, love the little people real big. Um, I've also served as, as an instructional coach. So you know, growing teachers on that instructional side. And then um, I'm currently in my second year as an assistant principal at a large elementary school in Leander ISD. We have over a thousand students wow. and about 120 staff members. So, wow. yeah, so that's my current gig. So um, you touched on something I want to circle back to in a minute about teaching young kids in, in that reading piece. So make sure you don't let me forget that. Okay. But first, what I want to talk about is I know because I texted you often about, Hey, this is really on my heart and I'm praying for you. And Holy crap, you literally have the job I would never want right now. <laughs> so as we're like coming off of summer and now schools are trying to like figure it out. So yeah. talk to us a little bit about what that was like as both a parent and an admin, because I know you want to protect your teachers. I'm sure that you want to protect your kids. And also you have this obligation as an admin to make these very weighty decisions. So talk to me a little bit about what that looked like for you guys. Yeah, so it, it's been heavy, to be honest with you. We started, um, I went back to work like July 20th, like the third week of July. And so it has been nothing but COVID since then. Um, and we really honestly, like I technically had a summer off, but I didn't. So 
um, you know, just thinking, and like you said, heavy hearts, like it's, it's really, really hard to make a decision that's going to please or benefit everyone in every angle right now. Right. And I have talked to parents from, um, you know, similar boats as, as I'm in with my child going back, because that's, you know, what I feel is best for her. Um, and then those who are choosing to stay virtual the entire year, and then those withdrawing and homeschooling and talking, of, and all three of those sets of parents are from different, you know, lifestyles and walks and have different needs. Their children have different needs and they've all been in tears, right? We've all been in tears about making these decisions because they're so heavy. Um, so from a mom perspective, um, you know, wanting to keep my daughter and my, myself um, healthy and safe. And, you know, I don't get to stay in one classroom. Like it's my job to serve in every classroom that's needed. And so my exposure is greater. Um, but then you have other people that get to stay in that small setting. So there's just so many different um, pieces to it. So the thing that I've learned the most, and I actually told a coworker this today, um, you know, both will for more than anything, just in education, like every one of us has a different sensitivity level. And we have to be mindful of that with our students and our staff. Um, you know, when we give families a choice to choose which setting they're going to educate their children in, it takes choice away from staff, yeah. um, you know, for that in-person piece. And so that's a hard, that's hard, right? Um, because like you said, we want to protect all of our people and that's staff included. So it has been very difficult to, um, extend grace to everyone because when you make a decision, the other party feels as though they're not being validated or heard. Yeah. Um, so it's difficult. Yeah, definitely. Um, so as you know, cause you're in our, in this community, um, we have, you know, there are moms in all seasons of life. There are grandparents raising um, grandchildren in this group. There are caretakers. There are people with multiple children that are extreme children, some that have neurotypicals as well, like we do. Um, so one thing that we've struggled with a lot, and I feel like I hear this very consistently across the board, is my kid is X years old. And I don't know how to, and I would say that the three things that are the hardest, so if you could maybe just give a little tip or a, hey, I did this when I was teaching that age, um, learning to read, um, trouble with writing, like, hey, I their kid just doesn't like it. What are, what can we do to make them, you know, not hate their life? Um, and then um, the third one is teaching math concepts. We have a lot of parents in this group who ha are raising um, kids who have autism. And typically, though our son is not autistic, he does share some um, characteristics of, the, of children on the spectrum where it's very black and white. So we had a mom earlier today that said, my son, when I teach him three plus four equals seven, he then doesn't want to hear that four plus three equals seven or that five plus two equals seven. That doesn't make sense to him because three plus four equals seven. So just even the smallest tip to help guide us, because I think for a lot of us, we're having honest discussions about like, hey, how, how badly would it affect our kid if we took a year off? Mm -hmm. If we just played and we just interacted and we just focused on behavior goals because we're losing it. Yeah. Um, so if you could kind of touch on those three and then maybe we'll talk about that behavior piece. Absolutely. So I, you know, first and foremost, one thing that we have really been talking to our teachers about this year is, I mean, we're you know, ethically responsible in a public school setting to, you know, teach, to educate, right? And to hit those, those state standards. However, we're in a pandemic and the trauma is real. And that is for, you know, neurotypical, atypical, that's for everyone. We are all experiencing trauma. And so I, I think that parents, and I've said this to parents and to our teachers, like relationships first, that social emotional piece, first. Um, and I, I really do mean that even in the public school setting, like I would go to bat against my school boards with that statement yeah. um, because these are people first and foremost. So if you, you know, from a parent perspective, like if you're, you're pushing and that kid's pushing back cause you're hitting their wall, let off, yeah. love on them first and then hit the standard when you can, when yeah. that window opens again, give yourself grace and give your kid grace. So 
that's my biggest overall with any overarching thing. So with my little babies and reading, um, I, you know, I'm a true believer in the, that kids, their light bulbs go on at all different times. And so it's our job to lay that foundation to provide those skills, you know, those phonic skills, letter sounds, you know, identifying, you know, uppercase and then the lowercase and giving them all those, planting all those seeds essentially, and then them just starting to put it together. The more you can um, read to them out loud and the more you can grow their vocabulary and exposure to literature, the more it's going to click. And then also really, really including their interests. So, if, you know, I, I can tell you one of my sweet babies I will never forget in my last year teaching first grade, it's on the spectrum, um, w was also diagnosed ED. So we had, we, had a, we had a year and we battled, but that kid loved sharks and I used it <laughs> every way I could. Yeah. So he was actually a very great high reader, um, came in reading prior to first grade, really strong. Mm -hmm. Um, but he was the one that struggled with writing. And yeah. so using that passion and tapping into what his interests were really helped. Not yeah. what did it help every day? No, sure. but it did. It did help me have fewer battles because there was interest there. Um, so I think, you know, including what they're interested in is very valuable. Um, I don't know, especially for boys and writing and that y'all, the writing piece is for all kids. Like you either love it or you hate it. Mm -hmm. I, I'm a strong believer in that. And, um, you know, trying to find fun ways, like, yes, we want to, you know, encourage neat handwriting and things like that. But I think sometimes we look at that so much that we, you know, make the writing process stagnant. And so making it fun, give them smelling markers and fun gel pens and uh, however you can get creative with it, let them go to town, yeah. you know? So yeah. One thing that um, we were talking about, it's been a few weeks ago on one of the freebies I gave away on a Monday is about um, writing um, vertically. So like our son is a good writer. He just hates to write. And the difference in his handwriting when he's on his meds and when his meds are wearing off is like laughable at best. And so we have smelly like dry erase markers and he will sit there and write and have no issues. So my documentation just looks differently. I'm taking a picture of that to log it rather than obviously it's not on paper where I can just save it. Um, and the other thing, just as a former English teacher, that I, my heart will always say this to people, please do not make writing a punishment. <laughs> no. Please don't do that. Don't make them sit and write mm -hmm. sentences. I will never do this again, whatever. Because then not only does it discourage people who may develop a love of writing, they just haven't yet, but mm -hmm. also it equates writing with negative connotation. And that is, makes yeah. it very hard for teachers like me down the road Mm -hmm. But also, you know, most people like me who are writers by trade, it's because we had a teacher one day that told us, hey, you're onto something here, you know? And so I think if you are a mom who's chosen to homeschool, don't take that job lightly. Um, and I don't say don't give yourself grace. I'm not saying like be so serious right. at all. I'm just saying you have a really special role now, mm -hmm. um, you know, a different role than mother or caretaker, you're now teacher. And that carries a lot of responsibility and a lot of really cool stuff too. So I love that you said, focus on something they, they enjoy. A lot of our kids, whether they're on the spectrum or not, they have some sort of um, obsessive tendencies where they get super like hyper focused on dinosaurs or sharks or you know, arts and crafts is like their thing. Like my daughter's neurotypical and that sister will sit there and color all day long. Yeah. So if they like to do it, yeah, I think I really love that tip. And I want to reiterate, um, so mamas that are struggling right now, when you're watching this on playback, hear me say, you heard Erin say, and she's a professional and has like the letters after her name to prove it. <laughs> like, do not stress yourself out because these kids will learn how to read. These kids will eventually write, but we are the ones that somewhere hundreds of years ago decided, you know what, in America, we're going to go to school for 12 years and it's going to look like this. You're going to be in this grade at this age and you're going to do these state standards and otherwise you don't get a pass. We made that up. Okay. People were writing before that, whether it was on a cave wall or on, you know, papyrus, we were doing it. So I feel like if we can take the heat off of ourselves 
and take the heat off of our kids and make it as enjoyable for both of us as possible, Mm -hmm. then you're going to experience and your child will experience learning so differently. Mm -hmm. So if all you can do is read to your kid, awesome. Hey, you did great. Gold star sister. (laughs) Um, So I think we really have to like chill the heck out sometimes. Um, And so I really love that you said that because I think sometimes as moms, like, you know, we said, you, you've worn the hat as teacher and now you're wearing the hat as principal, but you're a mom first. Mm -hmm. And so I think we tend to easily give grace to others before we do ourselves. Oh, spot on. So I'm sure that you can see yourself giving grace to some of your teachers and then coming (laughs) home with your daughter and being like, Oh, I should have done this. Or why didn't I do that? Mm -hmm. Or, and we we gotta stop that. We gotta stop. Yeah. Well, and I was the mom that, so my little one just started, she's in first grade now. And so going into kinder, I mean, she had some pre-reading skills, but she wasn't like reading by herself and I did not push it. And I went back and forth of like, oh, I know like educator, I taught this, but what do I do? Oh, there's my nugget. Hey, honey. Uh, (laughs) Say hi. Hi. Hi, beautiful. (laughs) Um. But, you know, I really, I struggle with that decision-making and I I let off and she took off on her own and it didn't need to come from me. I wanted to control it, right? I was the the educated one, but when I let off, she really blossomed. And the same thing with writing this year. So, you know, that, that was a struggle for her in the spring a lot. And, you know, she was having issues with it, just not loving it, not wanting to do it at all. And she has this like vivid vocabulary and all these wild ideas that just could not get them on paper. Yeah. And so two things helped with us. I started sticker stories. And okay. so I would give her like a little comic strip and she would choose four stickers and we would have, or three, we started with three, a beginning and a middle and an end. And we would write about those stickers. And so it gave her, it took away the like having to choose what to write about because yeah. I provided that. And then she was able to, you know, just write three sentences based on beginning, middle, and end. Love that. And the other thing was when she wanted to get into more developed stories, we recorded her saying the story. And then we agreed, we listened, we played it back and listened to it. And we agreed on a beginning, a middle, and end. And then she wrote it down on paper. That is awesome. Yeah. It just gave her something to go off of that was her idea and not mine. Yeah. And, and I will say, you know, the, my last year of teaching, I taught inner city high school students. And of course, most of my students were coming out of incarceration. So their reading levels were very low or some non-existent. Yeah. And so we did a lot of voice to text writing mm-hmm. papers. We did because the, the academic rigor was still the same. Right. And so finding ways around that is okay. So mm-hmm. empower your kid instead of enabling them. I think those two words can get a little muddy in the water. If you do it for them, you're not teaching them. Right. So you need to empower them by giving them some sort of tools to work with. And then also, um, and I can see that I can hear it in your voice. And I felt this, I feel this way every day when I homeschool my kids. Um, <laughs> like, I think we're really hard on ourselves. We're like, Oh, so my son will like transpose letters sometimes and he's not dyslexic, but it, and that's a typical thing that kids do just yes. so you moms know. Yes. They might write a nine like a P and it's fine. It's, they're not going to like end up in jail. It's okay. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think that we need to chill out on that sometimes. Like, mm-hmm. Hey, your handwriting got really sloppy here or whatever. Like what I tell Briggs is, and a lot of our kids, um, I say all kids, but especially extreme children, they really need an, an expectation up front. So don't be the teacher that's like, when they say, what are we doing today? You say, whatever, I feel like it, or you'll find out. But this is not a CIA operative. Okay. Let them know, put it on a board, hang it up, yeah. tell them it will help with your transition. So they don't freak out as bad. Yeah. And also I'll tell Briggs, like, um, I'll say, okay, so for this assignment, all, all mommy's looking for is that your capitalization and your punctuation is correct. Mm-hmm. I just want to see it. I just want to see that it's there. So he knows all bets are off. I don't have to worry about if I spell it wrong, if it something's backwards, like Mm -hmm. he knows what I'm looking for. And so I think letting them know that is really empowering because it takes the pressure off of them. Yeah, no, Um, I agree. That's a great point too. I mean, we're, even as adults, we want to know the why behind what we're doing. And so providing that why really takes away some of the battle mm -hmm. and especially with writing because there's so many skills involved in the writing process. And so when we focus or harp on like, you know, transitions or I don't know, just the the nitty gritty, we sometimes completely squash that writing process. 
Yep. And so being careful about it. And like you said, being upfront is really helpful for kids. Yeah. Um, the other thing I would add to that, and this is something we're doing um, like informational and explanatory writing right now with Briggs. And we mm -hmm. stick to three sentences, even though a paragraph will be three to five, because this kid will take the shortest shortcut of all time. Because again, writing is not his jam. <laughs> Um, but what we'll do is I'll be like, all right, I want you to show me how to build this Lego car. And so he will talk it through. He will show me that he has kind of mastery of that skill, even though he's not writing it down. And then, like you said, with the sticker stories, pick a beginning and what do I have to do first? Yeah. And what comes next? And then what will make it finished? And then he's able to write that he's done it with his hand. So a lot of our kids are very tactile yeah. learners. That's super like involve that kinetic, that touch, that, do that. Um, so talk to us a little bit about math, because as we both know, I do not math. That is absolutely <laughs> not my spiritual gift. And we struggle hardcore in this house because my son is really smart with math and he surpassed me a long time ago. So in, enlighten us, please. Yes. So, well, I'm not a, like a super genius either. So I just, my approach with, with math is nothing but hands-on. So I teach everything, every concept. I taught tactile and kinesthetically before I ever put in like numbers to it at all. And so getting, you know, whether it's pennies or beans or whatever you can get in their hands and make them manipulate it and talk through the process before you ever put numbers or, you know, an equation to it, I think is very beneficial because then they get the, the process and they don't get squashed by or stuck up on the, you know, the number piece of it. Yeah. Um, also too, with math, I feel like it's really helpful that when they, when a student solving a problem, have them talk it back to you yes. because then they're talking back through the process of what they did. And it's kind of putting it more, it's taking the abstract and, and making it more, you know, matter of fact to them, like in real life. And I hate that April's not on here because she's usually in our videos, but she's the one that had the question she's teaching her okay. son. She's homeschooling this year. And I, I want to say he's six. Okay. And so she was the one that had that question about three plus four equals seven. Mm -hmm. So I kind of wonder, and I know her son's on the spectrum. I kind of wonder if she had mentioned she had used some manipulatives, but I wonder if we present it with manipulatives, if we mm -hmm. don't even, we're saying the number, we're verbalizing the number. We're not writing out on a whiteboard, seven mm -hmm. plus whatever. Right. So if we have little styrofoam blocks or if we have Legos or if we have whatever we have mm -hmm. and whatever your kid likes, seven sharks, whatever it is. And we let them move that around and we show them here's five sharks and two sharks and guess what? It's the same. And mm -hmm. four sharks and three sharks is the same. Yeah. Um, I, yeah. I'd love to see that in action. So April, this is a challenge to you when you watch this playback. I want you to comment because I want to hear how that goes with your, your boy. I think yeah. that would be helpful. You know, another thing that I used in um, both kinder and first grade was, and I wish I could, I don't even know the name of them, but they're like kid plates, paper plates. And they're like, um, zoo characters. So they have like a lion and a zebra, but it's like the, the face of it is the big part of the plate. And then they all have two ears. Yeah. I remember those. Yeah. And so I always taught addition or subtraction like that. And so you would have the two, you know, the three plus the four, and then they would move them together to combine to seven. Well, you can flip obviously the four to the three and see that it still ends up the seven. Okay. Um, and I taught subtraction the same way. So I taught them, you know, when you have subtraction, your big numbers in the big spot, and then you break it up into two different pieces and then vice versa. Right. Um, but that was a really strong visual to see, like they actually had a place to move to and manipulate it before. But I did, I taught math concepts with manipulas before I ever put a number to it. I think even as an almost 40 year old mom who can barely add, if I had, if I could go to the grocery store and be like, excuse me lady, you're going to have to pause. I have to get out my cubes here and see how much this is going to cost. I probably would actually understand what the heck we were talking about, but I don't think anyone has that kind of time. That's why you're my people because I would do that too. Yeah. <laughs> like, um, yeah. Okay. So we just have a few minutes and I want to touch on the virtual learning because I think no matter how much we are pro going to school, pro staying at home, whatever, I think everyone has had the conversation of, what if we are dual, you know, partial mm -hmm. half and half? What if we, what if they, the numbers go up and we go virtual again? Like, what are we going to do? And I know for a fact, because we experienced that this is why we pulled in homeschooled. Um, our son's needs do not get met virtually. It's impossible. And excuse me, though, 
my husband and I are very aware of how fortunate we are to have the experience that we do, even though neither of us are experts as far as that's concerned for our son's age group. I can't imagine what it's like for parents that don't have that background mm -hmm. to be thrown into trying to meet accommodations that we have IEPs, 504s, all these meetings for, and then magically figured out, like, here's your assignment. Mm -hmm. So can you give us some tips that maybe you guys have talked to your staff about, about how to support your parents that are trying to do this, that we're just really, it's a disaster. Yeah. So the first thing that we really implemented, so our, in our district, everybody um, started virtual for the first four weeks. And so we had a hundred percent thousand kiddos all virtual. And, um, and we were definitely in that position of um, for our students that are choosing virtual moving forward, we did amend some of their IEPs based on those academic minutes because their ELA minutes are drastically different than in building sure. minutes. So, but we didn't do that for the kids that are phasing back into the building. So we we're kind of in this like holding pattern with some of those kids. The very first thing that we did was provide think tanks for uh, families to meet with special education teachers, depending on their programming. And so if they were in a behavior unit, those teachers provided twice a week think tanks. Um, and so I think, you know, that is something that I would advocate for every parent to request. Because, is that a question and answer situation? Yeah, so it's basically like a, there's no agenda in the meeting. It's an open-ended come and go, but like just a conversation. And I'm going to tell you, that's where we learn what the families are actually going through. Because we can do things on paper, but we don't know what that's going to look like in reality. That's right. And all of our learners are individual and independent and unique, and they're all responding very differently. Yeah. Some that we were most concerned about are flourishing, and some yeah. that we didn't, they weren't even on our radar, are really struggling. And we're not there to see that firsthand. And we've so, had a lot of mamas in this group say, you know, my kid, that, my extreme child actually did awesome virtually. Yeah. And my neurotypical mm -hmm. kid was like, what the crap is going on? Yeah. You know, so... I think we're all figuring that out for sure. I'm glad Absolutely. you said brilliant. Yeah. So I definitely think think tanks are just finding that regular time period to just have open conversations with, with support staff. Um, I would, you know, encourage parents to do that as well. But I think too, um, you're, it's not, I mean, yes, technically you're wanting to accommodate for your child, but it's not going to be possible to accommodate a full list on an IEP at home. Mm -hmm. It's just not. And so you have to take that burden off of yourself as a parent and remember that you know your child best. And so find, find the little small tweaks, the little small adjustments and run with those first yeah. because you're going to stress yourself out and then your child trying to do that entire list. It's yeah. not physically possible every single assignment and lesson. So I think yeah. giving yourself grace is really important. And I think too, we had a couple weeks ago, my friend Melissa um, did a how to for your IEP binder and what kind of things to just to include. And so mm -hmm. whether or not your child's accommodations or you feel your child's accommodations are being met with how schools are in your district right now, the ultimate recommendation I can give you after give yourself and your child grace is document everything. So if you are trying to meet this accommodation and it's a wild failure, you better write it down. Like I sat down to do this math work online with the student, took an hour and a half, had three meltdowns, what, um, whatever it looks like for you. I would write the time of day. I would write, uh, you know, if they had a good morning or a bad morning before that, I would write down where they were in the house. And, and truly, here's why. We've done this before for different behavior regression situations. Mm -hmm. It is very telling. And you can't think, you can't remember all that afterwards because you've been through it. But if you're able to look back on a week of working with your child and see, oh my gosh, I didn't ever notice that at 930 every single morning, they freak the heck out. Or if they didn't get breakfast, they act like a monster or whatever it is. And almost always, and it's not always predictable, but a lot of times you can tell, like, we know, I can tell you exactly the hour lull between med dosages where it's going to be a nightmare. So guess what? We're doing gym. We're doing art. We are running around the house. We are rock climbing. I don't care what we're doing, but it ain't in this house. We're not sitting down because he's that's not, right. that's not going to work. And so mm -hmm. I think that ties into the grace that we need to have for ourselves and for yeah. our student. And I would mm -hmm. also say on behalf of you as an educator and an admin and of staff that's teaching right now, um, 
give them grace because no one, I don't know anybody's job that everybody was just mystically overnight. Like, by the way, you need to learn how to teach it like this. And uh, we expect you to do it. And also the entire economy of the nation is riding on your shoulders. It doesn't even make sense. It doesn't even go together. Okay. We're just making crazy stuff up now, but teachers did it. They did it. And no one's doing it beautifully and perfectly because we don't know what the crap this is. And no one was ready for this. There wasn't pandemic 101 in college. We didn't take that class. So I think we need to chill the heck out, first of all, and we need to support our teachers in any way we can. But if, if accommodations aren't being met, document the mess out of that and then take it to that IEP, you know, board committee, whatever, and say, hey, look, we got to figure something else out. This mm -hmm. isn't working. And if you have opted to homeschool, especially if you have an, um, an extreme child, um, I would just tell you, you know, we've already resigned ourselves to the fact our son is academically advanced by several grades. So thank the Lord. He didn't get that for me. Um, that he's just a smart kid. Like it has nothing to do with me teaching him, but I know I'm not going to make him dumber this year. So honestly, our goals are behavior oriented. Our goals are interpersonal. Our goals are spatial awareness. You know, we are, yeah. our goals are going to help him be a better human and to mm -hmm. strategize and learn coping skills because he's kind of at that age where, oh, now I'm getting embarrassed or I care about what people think. Mm -hmm. And you guys, we have to be aware of that social aspect of it too, right? Mm -hmm. Just like we miss our friends and we miss our families. Like our kids are just mm -hmm. like, what the crap is going on? And, you know, we're just expecting them to kind of go with it. And mm -hmm. so I think that there's a lot to be said for that aspect. Mm -hmm. Um, so Aaron, is there anything else that you would tell us just as moms and as people who are like for a lot of us kind of at the end of our rope right now with we're a month in or some of us six weeks yeah. in and we're like sweet baby Jesus in the manger. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know I do. I think that, you know, I'm, I'm always one that's going to remind a parent that you have to take care of yourself too. And that's hard. We don't do that as moms, we, you know, and, and dads too, as parents, but we wear that burden, right? And it's a choice that we make every single day. And it's pretty easy. You know, that's, yeah, of course, that's my job. I'm going to do it, but it will wear on you. And then that will wear on your kiddo. So take care of yourself and go with your gut. You know, your kid better than anyone else in this world. And you're making the best possible decisions for your child and know that and be at peace with that and That's make small changes. Preach. Yeah. I mean, seriously, I have to tell myself that all the time. I, I can't really screw her up that bad in one day, right? Like mm -hmm. I'm, I'm doing okay today. Um, but yeah, I mean, you know them, you love them and let that lead your decision-making make small tweaks when you can. If you don't make progress one day, that's fine. Yeah. It's okay. And I mean, we all, the world. Adults, We're like, like, that. Yeah, I have days where I'm like, forget it. I'm putting my hair in a bun and getting a coffee and going to Target like today ain't the day. And so yeah. we need to understand our kids are humans just like we are. And so like we had Monday off because of Labor Day. And so I will mm -hmm. just tell you, we do, we do a Monday to Thursday homeschool schedule. By Thursday, I don't know what happens, and this is in public school too, when I was teaching, it somehow, when you have a day off in the week, it's like the longest week ever, and I don't know what mm -hmm. happens with that, yeah. but our, my kids on Thursday, it was like a fraternity house here, I don't know what was going on, I was like, forget it, learning ain't happening today, so let's go outside, like I don't care, and mm -hmm. so we have to be okay with that, like that's the yeah. beauty of this like yes. weirdness that we're experiencing right now, is we do mm -hmm. kind of have that space to do that. And so we need to kind of cut ourselves some slack there, I think, too. Definitely. Definitely. Well, and laugh. you got to laugh. Yes. Always um, laugh. Everything. If you've learned nothing today, you should learn that if all else fails, move to Leander, Texas, because that's where the absolute best schools ever. And I mean, I'm diehard Ohioan, and I will say the little bit of time I've spent in Leander, wow. Wow, mm. on the neighborhood, the people, the schools, <laughs> the camaraderie, and the tacos, not necessarily in that order. Um, right. <laughs> just, it's just all fabulous. Yeah. So, Erin, I welcome. You know that I'm your biggest fan, and I'm so excited. I, I am so, I just love that I get to see your face tonight. I know. 
Saturday. I no, miss you. <laughs> it makes it late. You know, it's 10.05 my time. I should have been in bed a long time ago, so it makes right. it late. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, you guys, I'm so grateful that you're here. Um, share this community with people. Share this video with people because people need to be encouraged and they need to know that we're in this together. Um, so, Aaron, thank you. Yeah. Um, and I'm tell, oh, where can people find you online? Because if you're not following Erin, you're blowing it. <laughs> so I am on Facebook and Instagram at through grit and grace, through grit and grace. And I share her stuff yeah. often. You'll see me share it and say, shout out to my girl, Erin. Cause basically she's just the wordsmith of the world. So you guys oh, no, love don't her know about that. and follow her and she's the best. And I just love you, Erin. Thank you so much. Thank you. I, I love, love that baby you too. For me. I will. Bye.